good morning, uh, Professor uh, Koki, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, today is our 32nd uh, webinar uh, for Open Forum. So uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Professor Aboto uh, Koki uh, from Italy. So the title of the talk is Accelerating uh, Reactive Flow Simulations with uh, Data Kinetics uh, in Open Forum. So uh, before the talk, uh, I will first introduce uh, Professor Aboto uh, Koki. Uh, Professor Koki received his PhD in uh, chemical engineering and industrial chemistry uh, from uh, Politecnico di Milano in 2008. And from 2014, he is an associate professor at the same institution. Um, uh, professor Aboto was a visiting professor at the University uh, Libre de Brussels in 2014 and invited a professor at uh, saint joseph lac uh, in Paris in 2018. In 2009, uh, Professor Aboto received the ENI Award uh, Debate in Research Prize, and in 2020, he was awarded the Alexander won a Humboldt Research Fellowship for experienced researchers. The scientific interests of Professor Arboto are in the field of numerical modeling of reactive flows with data kinetics, with a special emphasis on formation and emission of pollutants, such as NOx and soot from combustion devices. He is especially active in the development and extension of Open Smoke Plus uh, Plus, which is a general framework for numerical simulations of reacting systems uh, with uh, complex chemistry. Uh, it is adopted uh, adopted by many academia res uh, research groups worldwide. Professor Aboto is also interested in the multi-scale analysis of uh, catalytic processes and uh, numerical modeling of uh, heterogeneous catalytic reactors. Professor Aboto is the author and the co-author of uh, more than 140 papers in international archival journals. So now uh, the time is yours, Professor uh, Aboto. Thank you very much. Um, uh, th thank you very much, Manwei, for uh, your uh, nice uh, introduction. Um, I'm sorry for the technical issues uh, I uh, I had. So hello everybody. So I'm ready to to start now. And so I would like first of all to thank the organizers of this uh, uh, webinar series on open form and combustion simulations for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about uh, uh, the recent activities that uh, my colleagues and uh, I uh, at Politecnico di Milano are carrying out in the open form uh, framework. So. Uh, uh, as you can see from the title of this presentation, I would like to, to focus the attention on the description. Excuse me, and, Excuse me. Yes. Uh, yes, we can see two slides. So uh, you are showing one slide and we can also uh, see the next slide. Okay, now it's better. Yeah, it's okay, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, um, uh, as you can see from the title of this presentation, today I would like to, to focus the attention on the uh, presentation of uh, uh, some numerical techniques uh, that we recently uh, developed and implemented in uh, open form for uh, uh, accelerating uh, simulations of uh, reacting flows with uh, detailed kinetic mechanisms. I mean, mechanisms including hundreds uh, of species and thousands of uh, reactions. So, um, uh, as you know, in uh, recent year, uh, the importance of uh, detailed chemistry in uh, combustion applications has been recognized and uh, demonstrated uh, to overcome the limitations which are uh, uh, typically offered by simple approaches based on uh, uh, equilibrium chemistry or global one-two-step kinetic mechanisms. Here in this slide, I just reported a couple of examples in which detailed chemistry is really uh, important. Uh, in the 
first, um, on the left side, you have this negative temperature coefficient region characterizing many uh, fuels and consisting in the uh, increase of uh, ignition delay time with respect to the uh, temperature. And this kind of behavior can be uh, correctly described in your numerical simulations only if you include uh, detailed low temperature uh, chemistry. Similarly, on the right side, uh, we have an example of counterflow diffusion flames fed with uh, hydrogen. And in this plot in particular, um, uh, what you can find is the ignition extinction uh, curve uh, for this uh, fuel. And it, it is quite evident that this complex uh, behavior with multiple uh, extinction and ignition uh, turning points can be described only if you uh, adopt uh, a, a detailed kinetic mechanism. But more in general, in combustion today, we have an increasing number of uh, um, applications and areas in which uh, the adoption of detailed chemistry is uh, strictly uh, needed to get reliable and accurate predictions. For example, in case of real fuels and uh, surrogates, uh, it is important to uh, account for the complex interactions uh, between the different, among the different components uh, of the mixture. And this requires uh, detailed chemistry. Uh, similarly, in a biofuel uh, combustion, uh, you, you, you have to properly characterize on a, a chemical basis complex fuels, um, oxygenated fuels typically, uh, which, have, which, which have complex chemistries um, with strong differences with respect to classical or conventional fossil fuels. Again, pollutant emissions, uh, this is an important topic, of course, in uh, combustion, and the formation of pollutants like nitrogen oxides or sulfur oxides, pHs, soot, is governed by a complex chemistry. So during the last 20, 25 uh, years, uh, the community uh, developed and uh, adopted um, always more complex reaction mechanisms, uh, uh, as you can see in this uh, very well-known plot uh, taken from a work from Lou and uh, Lo. In particular, uh, during the years, there was a constant trend in formulating mechanisms with increasing number of species and reactions, and we expected a higher uh, accuracy, uh, of course. But uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we have also to recognize that uh, introducing more and more species and reactions in a, a kinetic mechanism as a cost uh, in terms of uh, uh, computational resources that we have to uh, consider. Uh, I mean, um, um, if, if we have larger kinetic mechanism, we have to uh, consider a larger computational cost of the simulations. And so to, today we, we, we need numerical techniques and computational tools uh, to make the use of these large kinetic mechanisms computationally efficient and to make their integration in uh, uh, numerical codes, in uh, new codes, as smooth as possible. But what are the challenges, the main challenges that we have to face when we want to use detailed kinetics in uh, combustion simulations? First of all, the number of equations that we have to solve. By definition, detailed chemistry means a large number of uh, species and so a large number of equations. Uh, then uh, the transport equations for species uh, are typically very nonlinear because of the source term. Uh, associated with uh, the reaction rates, which are nonlinear functions of temperature and concentrations. And then we have also an additional uh, issue, uh, let's say, which is represented by the stiffness of uh, detailed kinetic mechanisms. I mean, we have many, many reactions, very fast reactions, slow reactions. So we have a wide range of characteristic times. Um, here in this uh, plot on the, um, on the left, uh, on the right, sorry. Um, I reported an example to, to better show the uh, existence of these different time scales in uh, uh, reacting systems. This is a very simple uh, uh, example referring to the uh, mass fraction profiles, normalized mass fraction profiles in a, a isothermal plug flow reactor. Uh, fed with a, a mixture of propane and air. In particular, these profiles are reported versus the time in a logarithmic scale. And you can easily recognize the uh, strong differences in the characteristic times governing the evolutions uh, of the different uh, species. Uh, 
Okay, we, we, we have orders of magnitude in uh, uh, of difference in, the, in these characteristic times. Of course, nonlinearity and uh, stiffness um, uh, re require the adoption of special numerical techniques uh, if we want to solve um, uh, reacting flows uh, using CFD. Uh, in particular, what we uh, need is uh, the so-called implicit treatment of uh, chemistry, which means that basically we, we cannot rely on uh, explicit methods in order to, uh, to deal with uh, detailed kinetic mechanisms in CFD. Now, there, there are many different ways in which you can uh, introduce uh, an implicit treatment of chemistry in uh, CFD simulations, but one of the most adopted uh, uh, solution is represented by uh, the so-called operator splitting uh, methods. Uh, according to this technique, um, you, you basically split the transport equation for a species, which is reported here, in uh, two uh, sub-equations, if you like, um, an equation accounting uh, for the transport term only, uh, I mean convection and diffusion, and uh, an equation uh, accounting for the um, uh, chemical reactions only, for the source term uh, only. Now, the, the advantage of this, uh, this approach is that uh, when we look at the uh, so-called chemical step, I mean uh, the uh, equation accounting for the source term uh, only, uh, instead of um, solving a, a huge problem involving uh, uh, all the species in all the um, computational cells of your uh, domain, actually the problem uh, is reduced to the sequence, sequential solution of a series of um, systems of ordinary differential equations, uh, a system per uh, cell. I mean, every cell uh, in your computational domain behaves like a sort of batch uh, reactor. And so it can be treated uh, independently uh, from the other uh, cells. And so instead of solving this huge uh, problem, we have to solve many, many small problems, uh, many small OD systems, one per cell, having uh, a size which is quite uh, small, uh, corresponding to the number of species in your kinetic uh, mechanism. And for the solution of these OD systems, we can adopt uh, um, what we define stiff ODE solvers. I mean, uh, solvers for uh, ordinary differential equation systems uh, uh, characterized by uh, some level of uh, stiffness. Um, now, in uh, open form, it is quite uh, easy to um, uh, introduce this kind of uh, approach. And if, if you like, in this uh, plot here on the left, you, you have the sequence of uh, operations you, 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 you should do in order to uh, apply this kind of uh, method. And th th the point is that actually, in this procedure, uh, typically most of the computational time is spent for solving the chemical step, uh, or if you like, the what I call the reactor network uh, step. Um, about um, at least 90, 95% of uh, CPU time is spent uh, here. Okay, uh, at this level here. And the problem is that unfortunately, the solution of this chemical uh, step uh, doesn't scale linearly with the number of species, but more than quadratically. So this is a big issue if you really want to uh, use very detailed um, kinetic mechanism, uh, mechanisms in your uh, simulation. So um, the, the, uh, the idea uh, here is to uh, consider uh, numerical techniques uh, which um, are focused on the acceleration of this chemical uh, step, since this is the uh, most uh, uh, computationally expensive part of the, uh, of the code. So um, I, in, the, in the following, I do not consider techniques, other techniques th that you can use to accelerate uh, your calculations based on tabulation for example, and so on. Uh, I just consider techniques uh, to accelerate the chemical step in this operator splitting uh, framework. Uh, you have to also to uh, consider an important point. Since, since we are uh, just looking at the uh, chemical step, um, without touching uh, the remaining parts uh, of this operator splitting technique, we should expect a, a maximum theoretical speed up that we can uh, achieve. 
Uh, and typically, this maximum theoretical speed up um, is depends on the size of your uh, kinetic mechanism. Uh, typically, the larger the kinetic mechanism, the larger the uh, overall speed up, the maximum speed up that you can uh, achieve, uh, as reported in this example, referring to a pulsating laminar couple flame simulated with different uh, kinetic mechanisms with different number of species. If you use, for example, this large mechanism, the maximum theoretical speed up you can achieve is 50. But in case of a small uh, kinetic mechanism, this uh, overall speed up is more uh, modest, uh, let's say. Okay, so I, I try to summar summarize in this uh, slide uh, the different techniques techniques that you can use, uh, which are used uh, in the literature to accelerate the chemical step. And uh, I organized these techniques in three uh, families. In particular, uh, first family uh, consists uh, in the uh, direct acceleration of the OD solution uh, in each computational cell. Um, another possibility is to reduce the number of cell, uh, cells uh, for which we have to solve the OD system by considering what we call cell agglomeration uh, or cell clustering algorithms. Or a third possibility is to uh, reduce locally uh, in each cell the uh, kinetic mechanism using uh, what, what, what we define dynamic adaptive uh, chemistry uh, techniques. Uh, on the right, I also uh, highlighted in red three different techniques, which are the techniques I would like to uh, spend uh, some words uh, in, the, um, in the remaining part of this uh, presentation. Um, in, in particular, so I, I will start with considering this optimal choice of OD solvers. Then I will move to the, uh, this PCA squared uh, technique, PCA based cell agglomeration technique that we developed in collaboration with Professor Ryan's speech group in uh, uh, Aachen University. And then I will consider this SPARC technique, sample partitioning adaptive reduced chemistry, uh, developed uh, in collaboration with um, my uh, uh, colleague and friend, uh, uh, Alessandro Parente in uh, uh, ULB uh, Brussels. Okay, so let, let me start from the uh, first uh, point, the first top topic, the optimal choice of uh, ODE solvers. Actually, this is not a real uh, technique uh, that we uh, use to accelerate, but it's more, uh, let's say, a sort of a series of observations and suggestions uh, to demonstrate that you can do a lot in terms of acceleration of your simulations simply by choosing the proper ODE solver for your specific kinetic mechanism you are using in your uh, simulations. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in uh, operator splitting methods with detailed chemistry, most of the CPU time is spent for uh, the, chemical, uh, the chemical step. And so if we want to accelerate this chemical step, the first operations we have to do is to um, uh, consider um, the optimal, an optimal uh, OD solver. I mean, we have to be sure that we are really using a proper uh, OD solver, which is suitable for the specific kinetic mechanism we are uh, using. Now, on the if you uh, look uh, at solvers. OD solvers available on the web uh, as uh, free open source solver solvers, you, you can find many uh, of them uh, specifically conceived for stiff uh, problems. Here in this table, I just reported some of uh, them that I used uh, in the past and I tested uh, in the past. So the, our idea was to uh, introduce all these possible OD solvers for stiff problems directly in open form in order to to have the possibility to test them uh, easily and to uh, and to have the possibility to choose the best OD solver for uh, the, the specific simulations we were uh, carrying out. So, uh, in uh, for this purpose, we uh, what we did was to create uh, uh, for our convenience, let's say, uh, for each solver we created a, a common C++ interface in open form um, that give us the possibility to compare, to switch from uh, one OD solver to uh, another one uh, easily. Uh, 
And so uh, this gives us the possibility to compare the performances of these uh, different OD solvers. The, here I have just an example of code, impl code implementation in open form for this interface. And the key point to, to observe is that we just need a couple of uh, lines of code in order to switch from one OD solver to another one. And then we have a series of uh, operations which are common to every uh, solver to uh, properly we set up the numerical parameters that we need. For example, the tolerances, the maximum number of iterations, and, uh, and so on. And then we can run these OD solvers uh, for uh, every cell in, uh, in every cell in the context of this operator uh, splitting method. Um, we, we did several, uh, we did many, many uh, tests uh, on benchmark uh, problems. So here in this slide, I just uh, reported the main results referring to a specific case. Uh, if you want to uh, have more examples uh, or uh, you want to know more about this analysis, you can have a look at the paper which is reported here. But anyway, uh, this uh, test uh, refers to a laminar coflow uh, diffusion frame, uh, which was simulated using 3D different kinetic mechanisms with uh, 19, uh, more than 150 species uh, and almost uh, 700 species. So uh, let's say small, medium and large uh, size uh, kinetic mechanisms. And here the bars um, refer to the uh, CPU time uh, that we need for integrating the chemistry in each uh, cell. So uh, as you can see for the small uh, size mechanism, uh, the performances of the different OD solvers are very similar. Uh, in this specific case, there is this DL, so the a solver which performs uh, better than the others, but the average performances are very, very similar. On the contrary, when you uh, increase the size and so the complexity of your mechanism, some uh, big differences uh, start uh, uh, appearing uh, among the different uh, among the different uh, solvers, uh, as you can see uh, in these two uh, in these two plots. So the the, the key message from this uh, analysis is that uh, um, first of all, the, you cannot identify the uh, absolute best uh, OD solvers for our, your uh, problem. But uh, I mean, every kinetic mechanism has uh, some special features, and so uh, you can only find the optimal OD solver for that specific kinetic mechanism. Uh, uh, depending on uh, several um, uh, aspects, uh, for example, the no number of species, so the size of your mechanism, the ratio between the number of species and the number of reactions, uh, the presence of lumped reactions or additional, uh, additional properties. So uh, it is uh, important, in, in my opinion, when you start your simulations uh, with detailed kinetic mechanism to spend uh, some time um, uh, in order to identify uh, the most suitable OD solver for uh, your problem. Let me skip this slide. Another point which is important in the, uh, in the uh, identification of o OD solvers is uh, the uh, concept of sparsity of a, a kinetic uh, mechanism. Um, so uh, th this is especially true for very large kinetic mechanisms. So um, uh, th the point is that if you consider a, a single species in a kinetic mechanism, uh, as you know, the number of reactions in which this species is involved is typically very limited. Uh, for example, four, five, 10 reactions. Okay, it depends on the, on the species, but this number is typically limited. So the, there, uh, if we consider a, a single species, um, we, we can recognize just a limited number of direct interactions with other species through the chemical uh, reactions. And these interactions can be uh, graphically represented uh, through this uh, matrix, uh, le let me call it the Jacobian sparsity pattern of a kinetic mechanism, uh, having a number of columns and number of rows, which is equal to the number of species in the kinetic mechanism. And now we have a, a blue point here in this matrix. Uh, if there is uh, a direct connection between two species uh, uh, through at least one uh, reaction. Now, in this specific example, referring to the mechanism reported here, you can see that uh, the number of these direct interactions is very, very uh, limited. Only uh, 0.5 
50% of uh, possible interactions is uh, covered by this uh, Jacobian sparsity pattern. Now, um, uh, it is important to recognize that in this case, we have this uh, large uh, sparsity uh, because we can exploit it directly in the uh, ODE solver that we are using for solving the, uh, the chemical step. In particular, um, in a case like this, what we can do is to use a sparse linear solver uh, inside the uh, stiff or the uh, solver using different uh, techniques. Uh, in particular, in particular, we, we, we can consider direct solvers or iterative solvers. I reported some of them, uh, some of them here. So instead of using a, a, a linear solver for dense uh, problems, in this case, uh, since the sparsity is very high, we, we can exploit these sparse linear uh, solvers. Uh, before showing some uh, results of the analysis uh, we, we carried out, let me add uh, this point. Typically, the sparsity of uh, a kinetic mechanism increases uh, with the number of species, uh, as you can see from this plot here. Uh, here on the horizontal axis, we have the number of species, and here on the vertical axis, we have the sparsity level of our mechanism. So you, you can see there is an increase, uh, typical, uh, a usual increase uh, of sparsity level with the number of species. But uh, we have to pay attention because uh, there are also some exceptions. Uh, for example, this polyme C116 uh, kinetic mechanism um, has a special uh, sparsity uh, pattern, which is reported here, uh, characterized by a very small level of sparsity, uh, as you can easily recognize. And this is because this mechanism was built using this uh, lumped reaction uh, technique, but of course, this is not now uh, relevant. So uh, even if the number of species and the number of reactions in this mechanism is very large, the sparsity level is very small. So in a case like this, uh, the adoption of a sparse linear solver is not convenient at all. I mean, as a rule of thumb, let, let's say, uh, adoption of sparse algorithms is convenient only if the level of sparsity is very high, let's say at least 95%. Otherwise, uh, there is no convenience, computational uh, convenience in uh, uh, adopting them. So um, some results. Here we considered, again, the same benchmark uh, case I already mentioned before, a laminar flow diffusion frame simulated with three different kinetic mechanisms, very large kinetic mechanism, let's say, um, and uh, characterized by a uh, high level of sparsity, uh, as you can see here from this table. And here we have the speed up factor that you can uh, achieve uh, in comparison with the uh, adoption of the same uh, CIF OD solver using a dense linear uh, solver. Um, and uh, as you can recognize, typically the speed up factor increases uh, with increasing size of your uh, mechanism, uh, which means increasing a level of sparsity of your mechanism, uh, as you can see from the, these gray lines. Uh, another observation is, uh, is similar to what I mentioned before. I mean, there is also in this case, we cannot identify the best absolute uh, sparse linear solvers solver for our mechanisms, but uh, it depends on the features of this mechanism. For example, for the uh, largest mechanism here, methyl decanoate, the best performances were achieved with the MKL Paradiso solver, but for uh, this normal obtain uh, mechanism, for example, the best performances were uh, achieved using this DGM uh, uh, RES uh, uh, solver. Okay, so uh, at the end of this uh, analysis, uh, the, the key message that uh, I, I want to uh, give you is that, uh, uh, again, before starting the uh, simulations, it is always a very, very good idea to identify the best uh, ODIS uh, solver and the best uh, sparse uh, linear solver because you can save a lot of computational time basically for free, just changing the uh, uh, solvers you are uh, using. Now, let, let me move to the second topic, uh, which is this uh, PCA squared uh, technique. Um, so the, the idea be, behind this uh, PCA square technique is was to combine uh, the concept of dynamic cell agglomeration and uh, the principal component uh, analysis. 
Um, so uh, dynamic cell uh, agglomeration uh, is uh, um, a, a, a technique, uh, widely used uh, technique, uh, whose idea is very, uh, very uh, simple. Uh, I mean, um, instead of um, uh, solving the OD systems associated to uh, each individual cell in our computational domain, what we do is to uh, cluster uh, to identify the uh, cells which have a similar thermochemical state, I mean, composition and temperature, to cluster them uh, and to perform the uh, numerical integration, the OD integration for uh, the cluster level, uh, let's say. Uh, and then uh, after the integration, we go back and uh, we map back the results to the original individual uh, cells. Of course, we expect uh, uh, a significant uh, saving in the terms of CPU time because now the number of OD integrations we are carrying out is uh, limited, is uh, done at the cluster level. So in this technique, we can identify three uh, main steps uh, as reported here, the clustering operation, then the integration of the usual um, um, equations, uh, the OD integration, and then the uh, remapping uh, procedure to uh, to go back to the uh, original individual uh, individual cells. Now, what's the problem of this uh, behind this kind of uh, approach? I mean, uh, uh, the point is that in order to uh, cluster the different cells, we have to define some metrics or some uh, similarity criteria criteria, let's say, to, uh, to, to group together the, uh, the cells. And of course, in principle, what, what we have to do is to look at the temperature and the uh, uh, composition uh, to, uh, to identify the cells which are uh, similar from the uh, kinetic point of view, from the thermochemical uh, point, uh, point of view. But this kind of operation, this kind of classification cannot be carried out uh, uh, if we uh, are using, uh, as it is, if we are using very detailed mechanism with hundreds of species, uh, the computational cost would be uh, too, uh, too large. So what, what we typically do is to select just a limited number of key species, three, four, five key species plus temperature, and uh, we, we, we perform the clustering operation just looking at this limited number of species, or if you like, this limited number of uh, features. This is the definition we, uh, we use. Um, but the, the uh, selection of these key species is in uh, some, some way, uh, some, um, uh, it is, let's say, arbitrary. Uh, I mean, uh, not always it's clear, uh, how to choose these uh, key species, uh, especially when you have uh, complex chemistry, formation of pollutant species, and, uh, and so on. And not always the, the um, selection we uh, adopted is the optimal, uh, optimal one. And so the, uh, the idea that we um, considered was to use principal component analysis to remove this uh, uh, arbitrary choice by uh, the, uh, the uh, user. So the idea is actually uh, very, very uh, simple. Uh, uh, at, e at every time level during our simulation, uh, we, um, we start by building these metrics here, these uh, metrics uh, describing the thermochemical state of our simulation, in which we collect the temperature and compositions uh, for all the species and uh, all the cells. Then we uh, apply PCA, principal component analysis, to this uh, matrix to identify the principal components. And then uh, the idea behind this PCA squared technique is to use the first principal components uh, as the features on which to uh, carry out the uh, clustering uh, operations instead of selecting in arbitrary way a number of species, a given number of species and uh, temperature. Um, so uh, in this way, we remove completely the arbitrary choice by the, uh, the user. And the only uh, user-defined de parameter that we need is the uh, number of principal components that we want to uh, consider, two, three, four, uh, usually, of course, a limited number.
So the uh, PCA square technique, uh, the, the methodology we proposed, uh, can be described uh, in this uh, simple cartoon reported here in the context of operator splitting methods. We have the usual transport step, which is not affected by this technique. And then we have the chemical step, which is now expanded in uh, four uh, different sub steps. So first of all, we uh, build the thermochemical state matrix. We apply then the PCA. We select the first principal components, and then we apply uh, a proper uh, cell agglomeration uh, algorithm by prescribing uh, a tolerance in order to, uh, let's say, control the level of accuracy that we want to apply. And of course, this cell agglomeration algorithm, this is a conventional cell agglomeration algorithm, uh, including the three operations I already mentioned uh, before, clustering, integration, and uh, uh, remapping. So if we use this procedure here, basically what we have to prescribe is only the number of principal components that we want to track, or uh, in uh, different words, and this is actually what we uh, do, the level of explained variance, uh, TQ, that we want to uh, retain uh, in our uh, operations. Okay, typically 80%, 90%, and so on. So according to the prescribed level TQ, we will have a resulting number of principal components that we have to consider. Uh, so this is a much more rational uh, uh, approach. Uh, actually, the, these ideas were already proposed uh, several years ago by Perini and Wrights in the context of uh, internal engine uh, simulations. Here, what we did was to implement these ideas in open form and to apply them to the simulation of laminar and turbulent frames. Uh, let me skip these slides. Uh, okay, I prefer to uh, directly move to uh, some uh, examples. So uh, a, first, a first example of application was about laminar uh, co-flow, pulsating laminar co-flow of flames. So in particular, we uh, considered uh, uh, let's say uh, a um, co-flow flame fed with uh, uh, ethylene, uh, in which we imposed the sinusoidal fluctuations of the fuel stream uh, velocity uh, in order to create dynamic, uh, dynamic conditions. Uh, the simulations uh, uh, was carried out using a small size uh, mechanism with 44 species uh, in a two-dimensional uh, domain using the, the code laminar smoke plus plus code that you um, can download uh, if you uh, are interested in from uh, Git, uh, GitHub. So um, here we, we have a, a qualitative comparison between the results coming from the fully resolved simulation, okay, considering uh, uh, without applying any acceleration technique and the simulations carried out using the PCA squared technique uh, on the left and on the right respectively. Um, uh, for temperature, OH mass fraction, CO mass fraction and uh, NO mass fraction at different times. So as you can see from the qualitative point of view, there are no differences between the solutions. But of course, we, we need also to, to do a comparison on a more quantitative basis. So we introduce this uh, definition here, this global relative uh, error, uh, which is, let's say, the error between the fully resolved and the PCA squared uh, solution. And here we, we, you, you can find some plots reporting this global relative error as a function of the um, uh, explained uh, variance level TQ that we, uh, let's say, uh, prescribed or as a function of the user-defined tolerance in the uh, clustering uh, algorithm that we uh, chose. So the only two parameters that we need in this technique. And so as you can see, the behaviors are very regular and uh, in line with the expectations. If we increase the level of explained variance, the error decreases. If we decrease the tolerance in the clustering algorithm, again, the global uh, relative error uh, decreases. We are improving the uh, accuracy, uh, of course. But what we are really interested in uh, is uh, in the performances of this technique because the final purpose is to accelerate the calculations. Uh, in particular, here in this first plot, uh, you, what you can find in uh, blue here, this blue line, is the um, overall speed up uh, that we uh, are able to uh, achieve for different uh, levels of user-defined tolerance. Uh, you have to remember, as I mentioned, that there is always a maximum speed up, that theoretical maximum uh, speed up that we can achieve, that in this specific case is around 12. 
And so, uh, as you can see, if we increase the uh, tolerance, the speed up increases, but uh, at the same time, the uh, accuracy decreases, uh, as I demonstrated in the previous uh, slide. So, if uh, at least if we stay on this area here of the plot where we uh, are able to ensure larger accuracy, we can see that the overall speed up is not very bad, around five, six, uh, over a, a maximum, uh, which is uh, 12. Um, but everything improves if we consider a more complex kinetic mechanism for our simulations, for example, a mechanism with 200 species. In this case, the maximum theoretical speed up increases uh, around 20, uh, let's say, and the uh, overall speed up that we are able to achieve in our simulation increases too. Uh, we are now uh, around 9, 10 which is again a good, uh, a good result uh, without compromising the accuracy uh, as I demonstrated. Uh, in terms of computational cost, it is also interesting to look at these bar charts here, reporting the uh, cost of the different operations that we need in a PCA square. In particular, as you can see here, um, the transport step is not affected by the technique, so it, it is uh, independent of the uh, numerical parameters that we adopt in uh, PCA squared. Same story for the PCA uh, operation, I mean the uh, application of principal component analysis to the uh, thermochemical state matrix. This is independent of the um, user-defined tolerance. The cost for uh, clustering operations is very, very small, negligible. Uh, it's this uh, very thin layer uh, here on the top of these uh, bars. Uh, what changes, of course, is the uh, cost of uh, chemistry, because this is the purpose, purpose of this uh, uh, technique here. So if we increase the user-defined tolerance, we decrease the cost of the chemistry, but of course, we, we have to remember that we, have, we are decreasing the uh, accuracy. Uh, then we considered uh, an additional example, which is a more complex example, a temporally a turbulent case, a temporally evolving planar jet flame, which was uh, first introduced by Oaks uh, several years uh, ago. Uh, in particular, what we did was to uh, simulate this uh, uh, benchmark uh, case, uh, first using a two-dimensional mesh, uh, because we were interested in uh, uh, exploring the performances of PCA squared. So so we had to save a computational cost. And then we consider a real a complete 3D case. In particular, for the 2D cases, we use this mechanism with um, um, 57 species and almost 400 uh, reactions. So uh, here, we, we, first of all, we have a qualitative comparison between the fully resolved simulation and the uh, PCA squared simulations in terms of the temperature field. Here in this map, we reported the especially averaged um, uh, temperature uh, fields over XZ planes uh, versus time. Okay, so here the, the, the point is that we are not interested in these simulations for uh, studying or understanding the physics of combustion. We are just interested in uh, comparing the numerical performances of the different techniques. So also in uh, this case, we on a qualitative basis, uh, um, the differences between the fully resolved and the uh, PCA squared uh, simulations are uh, very, very, uh, very small. Um, we also, of course, considered uh, a more quantitative uh, analysis using a definition of a global error between the fully resolved and the um, uh, PCA squared simulations. And also in this case, what we uh, find, find, uh, found um, is a series of plots which are very, very similar to what we uh, found for the uh, laminar case I already mentioned before. So uh, the, the interesting point is that also in this case, we have uh, speed up factors uh, uh, around five, six, uh, uh, with respect to a maximum uh, theoretical uh, speed up, uh, uh, which is about 17. Um, so the result is not bad. Uh, then we move to the complete 3D uh, frame simulation here. Uh, and uh, sorry, uh, 
the video doesn't start, but uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, here, uh, th this is a more challenging case, uh, of course, because now we have a 3D simulation, but also in this case, the performances of PCA squared were uh, pretty uh, satisfying. Here, in this case, we consider just a mechanism with 11 species because this case was uh, computationally very uh, expensive. Uh, but the results were uh, pretty uh, promising. In particular, here, the uh, overall speed up that we can reach is uh, around uh, 4.5, and the maximum theoretical speed up is uh, 7. Uh, another interesting point is to, to, to observe is that the number of clusters that we identify uh, changes during the simulations because of the uh, evolution of these uh, um, uh, because of the ev evolution of the uh, flame during the uh, time. Let me see if I'm able to start, okay, the, the video. Okay, so uh, this is the evolution of the flame. So uh, at the beginning, everything is basically homogeneous. So you have a small number of clusters, but then uh, you have the evolution of the flame. And so the number of cluster changes. A third example is a two-dimensional turbulent uh, non-premixed uh, flame in decaying uh, iso isotropic turbulence. So this case was studied in the past by Bissetti and uh, co-workers. Um, and so here in this case, we have an initial strip of uh, fuel, which is surrounded by uh, the uh, oxidizer in isotropic uh, decaying turbulence. And what we were uh, really interested in, uh, in this case, was to adopt a very large kinetic mechanism with more than 200 species and a large number of reactions, more than 10,000, uh, including the um, chemistry for formation of soot particles and uh, aggregates. And the idea was to test the PCA squared, um, uh, the ability of PCA squared technique to uh, correctly capture the particle size distribution function of soot particles and uh, aggregates, which is a very challenging uh, uh, purpose, uh, of course. Uh, this is just an example of the numerical simulations uh, uh, at different uh, time levels, uh, referring to uh, some key uh, fields, uh, mixer fractions, uh, it release rate, and uh, fields related to uh, suit, in particular, particle number density and suit volume fractions, just to give you a, an idea of the uh, evolution of these uh, this system. And again, here in this plot, I reported the uh, three typical uh, particle size distribution functions that you can find in this simulation at three different uh, times. So in this plot, you have on the vertical axis the number of um, soot particles or soot aggregates uh, versus the diameter of the particles or the uh, aggregates. And these curves are, have the typical shape of uh, particle size distribution function uh, in, uh, for soot in uh, laminar flames. So our purpose was to see if PCA squared uh, was able to correctly capture uh, these uh, distribution uh, functions. And here we have just uh, uh, an example of uh, results. Uh, in particular, here on the top, we have the soot particle number density, uh, the comparison between the soot particle number density for the fully resolved and the PCA squared solutions with different numerical parameters. Also in this case, on a qualitative basis, there are no big differences. But what we are uh, really interested in is in looking at this plot here, in which we have the comparison of the uh, predicted particle size distribution functions, uh, the fully result, which is the blue line, and the PCA squared solution with uh, the same parameters uh, reported, uh, reported here on the, uh, on the top. Again, the agreement is very, very uh, satisfactory. Uh, here uh, on, the, on the right, on the contrary, we have the number of PCs that we are tracking in uh, our uh, operations versus time, according to different uh, levels of uh, um, prescribed uh, variants, um, variants prescribed by the, uh, the user. Uh, of course, this number of PCs changes because of the evolution of the frame, but uh, even for a large uh, variance, 98%, which is a very, very large explained variance, uh, we have a limited number of PC, around 10, uh, 12, uh, we, 
explaining why this uh, type of uh, technique is uh, so uh, so powerful. And then, in terms of computational performances, we can see that the uh, theoretical the uh, speed up we we can achieve decreases a little bit during the simulation, but uh, the average value is around uh, ten. The maximum theoretical speed up is twenty. So again, these uh, performances are uh, satisfactory. Okay, now uh, I uh, have uh, some minutes. I would like to spend last minutes on this third technique, which is the uh, sample partitioning adaptive reduced chemistry uh, or SPARC technique that uh, uh, we developed in collaboration with the uh, Professor Alessandro Parente uh, group in uh, Brussels. Um, so the, the idea behind this technique is to combine uh, dynamic adaptive uh, chemistry uh, and machine learning uh, uh, algorithms in order to, let's say, speed up uh, all the uh, operations. So dynamic adaptive chemistry is a well-known uh, technique, a well widely uh, adopted technique consisting in uh, reducing on the fly uh, the kinetic mechanism uh, in each uh, cell. Uh, according to the thermochemical state of the uh, of the cell. Uh, now, th this technique is very powerful, but there is a drawback. I mean, uh, if the size of your kinetic mechanism is large, the time that you spend for reducing on the fly at each time a step, the kinetic mechanism um, uh, it can be large. I mean, so you are wasting a lot of time for uh, reducing the kinetic mechanism. And so at some point, uh, th there is no advantage in terms of uh, speed up for the uh, chemical uh, chemical step. And so the, the idea uh, that we considered was to um, uh, um, carry out the reduction of kinetic mechanisms in a pre-processing phase. Uh, in order to save computational time. And so the, the idea was to, uh, let's say, to create a, a training data set. Uh, I mean, a, a data set uh, including a covering uh, in terms of uh, composition, um, uh, covering the composition space, which is expected to be visited by uh, the reactive system of interest for which we uh, are going to uh, consider the CFD simulation. Um, and then during the CFD simulation, uh, we, we basically look at every uh, individual cell and we try to identify the most suitable uh, reduced uh, kinetic mechanism from the library that we uh, built in the pre-processing step. So in this way, we are uh, adopting uh, reduced mechanisms during the CFD simulations without uh, the need to reduce on the fly, the kinetic mechanism. The mechanisms were already reduced in this pre-processing step. So th this procedure uh, consists in uh, two main phases, a training phase and a simulation phase. Training phase, uh, in the training phase, we generate the data using typically simplified systems like one-dimensional frames or ideal reactors. Then we cluster. Uh, the different uh, observations uh, uh, to identify, let's say, uh, clusters, uh, including observations with similar thermochemical states. And for each cluster, we produce a, a reduced kinetic mechanism, which is the third uh, operation, uh, using a proper uh, reduction technique, for example, DRGEP or other techniques. And then during the uh, simulation phase, we look at every CFD cell. Uh, and we identify uh, the uh, best uh, reduced uh, mechanism from the library that was uh, built uh, before. Of course, the, this kind of operation uh, is uh, able to accelerate uh, everything if we are able to uh, identify the best kinetic mechanism in a fast way. I mean, if we have a fast uh, classification algorithm to be applied uh, on the fly. Now, um, let me show uh, you a uh, uh, first example. This is an example referring to a laminar coflow uh, flame, steady state laminar coflow uh, flame, simulated with a mechanism with uh, 80 species uh, and more than uh, 1,000 reactions. So the, uh, the first operation we, we carried out was to generate the training data set 
And in this specific case, we chose to use exactly the same system for generating the uh, data by imposing dynamic uh, conditions. In particular, we imposed uh, sinusoidal fluctuations in the velocity stream. And so we generated this uh, data set, this initial data set with more than 100,000 uh, observations. Uh, then we uh, adopted uh, a proper, uh, let's say, clustering uh, algorithm for uh, uh, grouping the observations having a similar thermochemical state. And then for each cluster, uh, we uh, produced a reduced uh, detailed kinetic uh, mechanism. Uh, actually, the, uh, the way we uh, do this kind of operation is to generate a, a single reduced kinetic mechanism for every observation in the, in the same cluster. And then we um, uh, create a single kinetic mechanism uh, for the cluster, which is given by the union of the mechanisms, uh, reduced mechanisms uh, for each individual uh, observation. But I mean, uh, in this uh, step, we, we can use uh, different re reduction techniques. What we did was to consider the DRGP technique, which is one of the most uh, adopted by the combustion community. Um, we have also the possibility to, uh, let's say, estimate the uh, how uh, homogeneous uh, is uh, each cluster in terms of uh, thermochemical composition. Uh, I mean, be because what, what we do, uh, what we want is to be sure that each cluster that we identify is sufficiently homogeneous from the thermochemical state. So we introduced this uh, dissimilarity coefficient, which is, if you like, a measure of uh, how uh, much uniform is uh, a cluster uh, inside. Um, here you have the definition, but uh, the, the important point to, to understand is that we, we, we have the possibility to check before uh, doing the CFD simulation if our uh, library of kinetic mechanisms uh, makes sense or uh, not is sufficiently accurate or, uh, or not. And then we, uh, of course, uh, applied this spark technique for uh, simulating the frames. So we, we started by simulating exactly the, uh, the same cases that we used for generating the data uh, to check if everything works uh, properly. And here you, you can have an example uh, on the steady state case. Uh, in particular, you, you have here the comparison between detailed and adaptive uh, simulations. Uh, the uh, qualitative comparison is very, is very good. Uh, you can also have some, a more quantitative uh, comparison here on the, uh, on the right between the adaptive and detailed uh, uh, chemistry uh, results. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, global relative error, we also, in uh, this case, we define a global relative error. Uh, you, 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 you can see that if we typically uh, decrease the uh, tolerance in the reduction of uh, kinetic mechanisms, we uh, have uh, better results, of course, in terms of uh, accuracy. But uh, of course, the computational cost increases be because we have to expect to have uh, reducing mechanisms with a larger number of uh, species. In terms of speed up, what we uh, observed uh, is a speed up factor, overall speed up factor, which is not bad, uh, around four or five, uh, depending on the uh, specific parameter we used. But of course, the techniques, uh, what we want to do is to use the technique for exploring uh, new conditions which were not part of the training dataset. And this is an example uh, in which we uh, explored the uh, performances of Spark for a, um, a steady condition which was not included in the training data set. Also in this case, if you look at both at the maps and uh, at this um, uh, parity plot, you, you can see that the performances uh, are uh, pretty uh, satisfactory. Um, we, we extended, of course, the analysis to uh, other cases. Uh, again, this is an example about, uh, uh, again, a co-flow flame with a larger kinetic mechanism, including more uh, chemistry. Um, but uh, now, in this case, what we uh, did was to apply two main changes. The first change was uh, about the uh, training data set, uh, the generation of training data set. Uh, what we did here was uh, a generation based on a, a different system, uh, a series of counterflow diffusion uh, flames. So we, we, we generated this uh, data set 
by considering many counterflow diffusion flames uh, by changing the strain rate from equilibrium conditions to extinction. Uh, and then uh, we uh, adopted this training data set for uh, the clustering, for the generation of reused kinetic mechanisms. Uh, the second change we applied was to use a, a different classifier uh, to be used uh, on the fly. In particular, we used, we explored here the possibility to use artificial neural uh, network. So basically what we did was to uh, apply the clustering step uh, and uh, then we trained uh, on the clusters, let's say an artificial neural uh, network and then we use this artificial neural network on the fly to classify the cells and to identify in a very, very short time the best mechanism for uh, each cell during the CFD simulations. And according to our result, we, we saw that the adoption of uh, artificial neural network was uh, beneficial in terms of uh, accuracy and speed up with respect to other classifications, maybe based on uh, PCA or local uh, PC, uh, PCA. So th th this kind of uh, options, the uh, this kind of option, I mean, artificial neural network seems pretty uh, satisfying. Um, I skip this slide. So let me just mention to, to conclude that uh, this technique is uh, able, this spark technique is able not only to uh, correctly describe the um, uh, general behavior of your flame, uh, I mean, in terms of temperature or main species, but also uh, in terms of uh, small species or minor species or very slow species, like for example, a C20 uh, species, uh, which is one of the suit, uh, suit precursors. Uh, so, we, according to uh, our, uh, let's say, simulations, we are pretty confident that this kind of technique can be uh, adopted in, uh, uh, in many, many uh, cases. So, let, let me jump to the conclusions. So, uh, what I try to uh, describe in the, this presentation is a, a series of techniques that we uh, implemented in uh, OpenFoam to accelerate the chemical step when we want to simulate combustion problems with detailed uh, detail kinetics. Uh, there are also additional techniques, uh, uh, of course. Uh, and now, before closing, uh, I would like to, to mention that in our group, we developed this uh, framework, which is called uh, OpenSmoke++ uh, that you, in C++ that you can use for modeling uh, um, reacting flows with detailed chemistry. And we coupled this um, uh, framework with uh, OpenFoam the open form framework to create some specific solvers in which we basically included the techniques uh, I tried to describe in this uh, presentation. You, you, you can find them on uh, GitHub if you are uh, interested in. Again, if you are interested in uh, detailed kinetic mechanisms, uh, you can have a look at our webpage, uh, the webpage of my group in uh, Milano, where you can find uh, detailed kinetic mechanisms in uh, chemical format. Um, I would like to uh, close by uh, acknowledging uh, my colleagues at Politecnico di Milano and the PhD students who, who collaborated on these uh, topics, and uh, Professor Heinz Peach and Temisto Gregrenga from uh, Aachen University, and uh, uh, Professor Alessandro Parente and Giuseppe D'Alessio uh, from ULB in uh, uh, Brussels. So uh, thank you very much for uh, your, uh, your attention. I was a little bit longer than uh, expected. Uh, sorry for that. Um, yeah, I'm now open to uh, answer your uh, questions if you uh, have. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your very uh, informative talk, uh, Professor uh, uh, Coach. So now we have questions from the audience. So uh, I will raise the questions for you. Yeah. Okay, uh, the first question is, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if operator splitting for surface mechanisms also results in typically sparse Jacobian matrix and uh, this is possible relevant to speed up. Yeah, this is the first question. Uh, okay, so if I were understood, uh, the question is about the possibility to extend homogeneous chemistry with uh, heterogeneous chemistry, surface chemistry, right? Uh, yeah, the audience cannot, cannot speak, yeah. Okay, uh, so let, let me uh, see if I, um, I think I have one slide on 
this point here. As, as, so um, actually, I focus the attention just on uh, homogeneous chemistry and the possibility to, uh, let's say, speed up the um, uh, chemical step when you uh, consider just uh, gaseous uh, reactions or reactions occurring in gaseous phase. But uh, actually, uh, the, the same concepts can be applied also when you have surface reactions, uh, of course. I mean, the, the, the approach is exactly the, the same. And this is what we uh, did in uh, uh, one of the solvers we developed in open foam, which is called catalytic foam. Actually, in catalytic foam, basically, you have the cells uh, uh, which, let's say, uh, belong to the surface, okay? Mm -hmm that uh, those uh, cells behave like a batch reactor, uh, including heterogeneous reactions. So uh, what happens is that for those cells, uh, mm -hmm. what you have to consider is a, a mechanism, uh, mm -hmm. including both homogeneous and heterogeneous reactions. But uh, I mean, uh, what typically happens when you use uh, detailed heterogeneous reactions, uh, detailed uh, mechanism also for the heterogeneous reactions is that, of course, the computational cost increases, but the steepness of your mechanism increases a lot. And here in this uh, slide, we have an example of performances of different OD solvers. Uh, in particular, here on the left, you, you have the performances when you just have homogeneous uh, kinetics. And on the right, what happens if you include heterogeneous reactions, a um, small number of reactions, small number of species, okay? But uh, everything changes from the computational point of view because now you, you have strong additional nonlinearities, strong interactions between uh, surface species and homogeneous species. And so what, what you find for the homogeneous case not necessarily can be replicated for the heterogeneous case. So you have, again, be, uh, to be careful and paying attention in the proper choice of the uh, OD uh, solver. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. And this is the first one. The second one is from the same audience. So uh, does the idea solver choice for a given mechanism stay consistent across different conditions? Uh, for example, like temperature. Okay, so this uh, is uh, her second question. Um, okay, uh, yes, uh, actually the, um, uh, the point is that in these pictures, in these uh, charts I reported, um, uh, the, the numbers you can read from the bars uh, are average numbers referring to the, uh, let's say, average values. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, um, not necessarily, uh, I, I mean, the performances of the OD solvers uh, may change with the uh, specific, uh, uh, let's say, temperature of each cell or the composition of uh, each uh, each cell. Um, but uh, I mean, according uh, at least according to our observation, what we saw that on the average, okay, the results that you can find from these uh, charts uh, can be um, adopted, let's say, in a general uh, in a general way. Then, of course, uh, I mean, um, in principle, uh, if you have uh, uh, your simulation with a given kinetic mechanism, maybe in some regions of your simulations, uh, a specific ODE solvers works better than another one, of course. But uh, I mean, you cannot uh, proceed in, the, in that way. I mean, you have some way to, to make a choice uh, to, to, to stay on a, uh, a OD solvers. And so the, the suggestion is to do some preliminary uh, tests uh, mm -hmm. to uh, identify what, uh, let's say, appears <laughs> at least the, the best uh, OD solver for your mechanism and to uh, apply it. But in principle, uh, what I mentioned can, uh, can happen, uh, of course. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. And then the next question is... Uh, uh, from Dr. Li Sampen. So thank you for the exci uh, exciting presentation. So can the dynamic cell uh, agglomeration technique be coupled with the RSAT asset method? Uh, from a certain point of view, they seem to have uh, similar ideas. Maybe the former focuses on different cells and uh, later on uh, different times. So, yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, there are some connections between the uh, dynamic cell agglomeration and uh, um, ISAT. 
yeah. in situ uh, adaptive uh, tabulation. Yeah. Um, uh, however, the, the strong difference is that in uh, uh, dynamic cell agglomeration, uh, what we do is to collect um, cells uh, having a similar thermochemical state and we, we, we perform a single integration, uh, integration for all these uh, cells. On the contrary, in uh, uh, ISAT, at the end, you try to um, um, perform a minimum number of integration, but what you do is to correct, uh, let's say, uh, the directly uh, the uh, integration you using the results coming from the uh, from the table that you are building on the uh, on the fly. Um, so uh, uh, actually, in the dynamic cell agglomeration uh, approach that we uh, adopted, uh, I skipped uh, some slides. But what we uh, did was to try to combine these two different, uh, let's say, uh, points of view. Uh, I mean, the uh, pure dynamic cell agglomeration and the uh, ISAT in the remapping uh, operations. Okay, uh, so so the, the point is that in a dynamic cell agglomeration, uh, of course, since you are collecting all the cells in a single cluster, uh, you perform the integration, uh, but uh, then you you know that the correct result for each cell when you do the remapping is not uh, exactly uh, the result of your uh, integration, which is done at level of uh, cluster. So uh, the idea is, was to correct uh, the uh, results of the integration in the remapping procedure using the mm -hmm. same concept that we use in uh, uh, ISAT. Uh, the, okay. the difference is that since we want to apply this technique to a very detailed kinetic mechanism, uh, you, you cannot apply ISAT uh, as it is because the computational cost would be too, uh, too high. So we apply uh, the ISAT technique at the level of principal components. Okay, okay. Uh, So uh, if we have a mechanism with 100 species, uh, we, we just select the first two, three uh, principal components, and then we build a, a ISAT table on the principal components, not on the uh, uh, species, on the, uh, uh, the total number of species, because otherwise it would be too, uh, too expensive. So, I mean, there, there is a strong connection between the two uh, techniques. Yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so can I ask you uh, questions? So um, yeah, sure. yeah, so uh, you, uh, you you use uh, a DAC method for simulation, right? So when we use it uh, online, so how about the computational cost for uh, for for example, like three dimensional simulations? Uh, so, sorry, uh, you you said we, we use the uh... DAC dynamic adaptive chemistry. I yeah. Think. yeah, yeah, yeah. So how about the computational cost when we use it? You know. Uh, in the online way, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean the uh, the cost of dynamic cell agglomeration is very, very, uh, very small. The additional cost is okay. very, very small if you use a proper uh, clustering uh, uh, algorithm. We we, we actually uh, explore two different techniques, which are the the, the ones uh, available in the literature, which are the uh, DMZ uh, technique or the binning uh, technique. But yes. actually, um, the, the computation, the extra computational cost for clustering is very, very small. It's negligible if you are using um, detailed, uh, detailed chemistry. Um, so maybe uh, you, you can have some additional cost, of course, in the remapping uh, phase. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there you have to be uh, careful. I mean, uh, you, 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 it depends on your purpose. You, you can do a remapping operation in a very coarse way, very fast, or if you want to improve the accuracy, you, you, can, do, uh, you can try to do something more advanced like uh, the techniques I was trying to explain before, uh, combination with ISAT. In this case, I mean, the computational cost can increase and so you, you have to be careful. But the, the cost for clustering, uh, let's say, just to create the cluster is, according to our experience, let's say, uh, very, very uh, marginal, very, very small. Uh, yes. OK. Yeah, OK, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, any other questions from the audience and also from the panel list? Yeah, OK. So uh, uh, maybe I ask uh, uh, 
another question. Okay, so you mentioned the most abundant species probably you know the key species, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, then when we uh, select the so-called the key species, um, sometimes uh, you know uh, you use the PC method, right? Um, yeah, uh, okay, so uh, the point is that uh, um, what I try to explain is that... Yeah, the first uh, point here, yes. Yeah, not necessarily, I mean, the most abundant species uh, is the best choice. I mean, not necessarily is a wrong choice, but uh, I mean, uh, the, the purpose is uh, of this technique that we develop is to make the um, the choice of the features on which we base the uh, uh, cluster um, more rational and less uh, arbitrary. Okay. So, uh, in principle, uh, I mean, you can also do something uh, a little bit different. I mean, you, you try to identify a priori the mm -hmm. best species that you um, want to include in the clustering procedure by doing, uh, as you are suggesting, a PCA analysis on a, let's say, um, on a uh, training data set or on uh, some preliminary uh, results. And this is fine. So you, you still use a, a classical com, conventional dynamic cell agglomeration algorithm by selecting a priori uh, in a smart way, uh, okay, in a rational way, uh, the key species. This is something that you, you, you can do. This is perfectly fine. Uh, what, what we try to do, to do in this PCA squared is to remove this, uh, this kind of uh, preliminary operations uh, okay, be because everything is done directly on the fly uh, automatically, just for convenience reasons. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, then any other uh, questions? Okay, so uh, if no other questions, uh, we thank uh, Professor Aboto uh, uh, Koki Ge. Okay, thank you very much for your very nice talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to you yeah. and uh, again for the invitation. And uh, thank yeah. you everybody for uh, listening to me. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you. And hope to see you soon, physically. Yeah, yeah okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you and take care and have a great day. Bye-bye. Have a good day, bye. Bye-bye and see you soon, bye. See you. See you.